traditional stages of industrial development to a higher level with disruptive technologies. We shall hear from our speakers their respective uh, appreciation of uh, the state of science technology innovation in the country, their suggestions and recommendations on what needs to be done and uh, to achieve our goals and how to go about meeting the challenges. There are challenges in advancing science, technology, and in, uh, innovation in the country. Among these are low R&D investments, limited number of researchers, scientists, engineers, weak linkages of actors in the innovation system. So how do we address all this and effectively engage government, private, and public institutions? other partners to achieve our goals under the Philippine Development Plan 2017-2022 and onwards. The Philippine Development Plan Chapter 14 specifically um, vigorously advancing science, technology, innovation focuses, focuses on uh, the technology adoption promoted and accelerated, innovation stimulated, there are four subsector outcomes uh, with the purpose of STI utilization in agriculture, industry, services improved, investments in technology based startups, enterprises, and spin offs increased, creative capacity for knowledge and technology generation, acquisition, and adoption enhanced and open collaboration among actors in STI ecosystem strengthen. <coughs> if I may at this point uh, just briefly introduce the DOST programs uh, relating to the STI, we have the Science for Change program, and here we have uh, NICER identifying the research centers or uh, universities which we have niches addressing regional problems. We have the RDE where we provide uh, upgraded uh, capacity to the r and institutions um, for them to have the experts to help them manage STI. We have the Cradle where we have collaboration on research and development with uh, Universities and Industry, and BIST, BIST, which is Business Innovation in Science and Technology. We also have the Human Resource Development Program, where we provide scholarships at the tertiary and uh, secondary level. We have science and technology facilities and services that uh, assist industry with their testing and cal calibration requirements. And also we have uh, facilities that would um, have um, storage of data to enable data analysis or um, information um, um, formulation of policies. And then we have the Small Enterprise Technology Upgrading Program where we have innovation S&T interventions uh, provided to micro, small, and medium enterprises. And we work with DTI, Department of Trade and Industry, uh, the Commission on Higher Education, Department of uh, Information and Communication Technology, among others. We on the IQS program, or uh, the where we, where we have innovation or inclusion strategy. So today, we bring together experts, academics, policy makers, private sector, civil society, and other partners in development to this forum. Uh, I'm sorry, I was excited to start off with, uh, with this session. I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Secretary of Sci uh, for Science, 
Scientific and Technical Services at the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, I shall now introduce our speakers who shall be giving their talks for about 20 minutes. After their talks in succession, we shall have an open forum for about 20 minutes. And after that, I shall um, um, provide the uh, highlights of their key messages in the wrap of the session. So we have uh, our speaker, Dr. Joel Puello. He is a professor. I'm sorry. May I request, please, our speakers to come forward and uh, be seated here. <coughs> Joel Marciano and Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. <clears throat> Dr. Joel Cuelo is a professor of biosystems engineering and director of the Global Initiative for Strategic Agriculture in Drylands at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. A globally recognized expert in engineering of sustainable biological and agricultural systems, Dr. Cuero has designed various engineered systems, including those applied in bioregenerative space life support, industrial mass production of algae cultures, and vertical farming. <coughs> Dr. Cuero conducted his postdoctoral research as a U.S. National Research Council Postdoctoral Research Associate in the Controlled Ecological Life Support System Division at NASA, John F. Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. He earned his PhD in Agricultural and Biological Engineering with minor in Chemical Engineering from Penn State and earned two MS degrees in Agricultural and Biological Engineering plant physiology, also from Penn State, and a BS Agricultural Engineering cum laude from the University of the Philippines at Los Banos. He is a lifetime visiting professor at Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, China, and a faculty fellow at the Innovation Center of the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. He has published over 55 refereed journal articles <coughs> and 11 book chapters, and has delivered over 300 presentations around the world. Dr. Puello is current president of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, or PAASE, and a corresponding member of the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines. He shall talk on building globally linked manufacturing and R&D science and technology innovation ecosystems in the Philippines an indispensable step toward inclusive <coughs> national development and to preparing for the fourth industrial revolution. Our next speaker will be Dr. David Hall. Dr. Hall is a senior technical advisor for economic development at RTI International. He was formerly the chief of party for the United States Agency for International Development, Science, Technology, Research, and Innovation for Development, or STRIDE program. He holds a PhD from Loughborough University in the United Kingdom. He has more than 30 years of professional experience specializing in engineering, science, and technology. He is experienced in industry-university collaboration as well as the creation, funding, accreditation, and management of new university programs and centers. He has served as Dean of Computing and Engineering at universities in the United Kingdom and in the United Arab Emirates. 
He has also served as the director of the Applied Technology Center at Kenyatta University in Kenya. More recently, he was chief of party for the USA Liberia Excellence in Higher Education for Liberian Development Project. In universities, he has supervised six research PhDs and has 50 publications and has generated or managed grant and private sector funding in excess of 30 million US dollars. Dr. Hall shall talk on developing human capital in science, technology, and innovation for the fourth industrial revolution. Next speaker will be Dr. Joel Joseph Mariano Jr. Dr. Marciano is a professor at the Electrical and Electronics Engineering Institute of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and is currently the acting director of the Advanced Science and Technology Institute of the Department of Science and Technology. He obtained his BS Electrical Engineering from UP Diliman and his PhD in Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. He was the UP Dado Banantao Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley in 2004 and at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of California, San Diego in 2005. In 2007 and 2009, he was a visiting associate research scientist in UCSD. His research interests include wireless communications and small satellite systems engineering as applied to rural connectivity, emergency response communications, disaster risk reduction, and scientific earth observation. Dr. Marciano is a recipient of the Gawad Chancellor para sa nanakotangin guro in UP Diliman, the most outstanding electronics engineer in the field of education, from the Institute of Electronics Engineers of the Philippines, the 2015 Manila Water Foundation Prize for Engineering Excellence, and the Distinguished Alumni Award in Science and Technology from the UP Alumni Association in 2017. <coughs> Dr. Marciano shall talk on data for the uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, the OSD ASTIS Science Infrastructure for Data and Computation. Next speaker is Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. He is a senior research fellow of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, a government think tank. He is a former chief statistician of the Philippines as secretary general of the defunct National Statistical Coordination Board. Dr. Albert is a professional statistician who has authored papers and popular writings on topics spanning poverty analysis, education statistics, ICT statistics, and big data, climate change, and innovation. He is also a member of various bodies and expert groups on statistical matters, including the UN Global Calls Privacy Advisory Group and the Philippine Committee on Higher Education technical community on statistics. For over 15 years, Dr. Albert has worked in two dozen countries supported by the development community, including the Asian Development Bank, and he has taught at several higher educational institutions and directed various statistical capacity building activities. He is a past president of the Philippine Statistical Association Incorporated. He took his B.S. degree in Applied Mathematics, Summa Cum Laude, and awarded for excellence in mathematics from De La Salle University with a DOST Science Education Institute Scholarship. He earned his Master's in Statistics and Ph.D. in Statistics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Dr. Albert will talk on the role of government in improving the science and technology landscape for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our distinguished speakers. <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yorobi, for the very kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about this topic here, uh, which has already been read to you. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here. I'd like to thank, of course, BIDS for uh, organizing this um, wonderful uh, conference, as well as for inviting me. So, uh, the Philippines is facing two major challenges based on the subject or the theme of this conference. The first one is um, being able to achieve a more inclusive national development. And the second one is, of course, preparing for the fourth national revolution, which is the theme of this conference. And, um, and so, I'm going to propose here basically a practical approach um, that uh, will be able to address uh, these two uh, major challenges here. But I would like to start by sharing with you uh, this, uh, there's something missing on top. These are the five stages of development, uh, which was proposed by W. Rostow. He's an uh, American economic historian back in 1960. And so I had to tinker with this because I needed to uh, update it into the 21st century. So what you're seeing here is the updated version of, of what he proposed originally. So essentially, of course, all countries begin with this. But then there's agriculture and mining, and those are the preconditions for economic takeoff. After that, there is a need for manufacturing, and that would re really result in the takeoff of the national economy. Uh, in in Rostow's original um, rendition of this diagram, the next step is a drive toward maturation of the industry. But in the 21st century, you're not aiming just for maturation. You have to um, aim for innovation so that you could achieve further growth of the industry. So drive to innovation in the 21st century is accomplished by a combination of higher value manufacturing, which really is manufacturing plus <coughs> research and development. And that serves as the foundation for the drive to sustain growth, which is the high-tech innovation or the knowledge-based value creation. So at the moment, the Philippines is right in this stage. Um, the Philippines is experiencing a renaissance in manufacturing, which is here. But then there's the challenge to move up the value chain, which is the next stage, and that is manufacturing and R&D, which uh, drives value creation, and then ultimately is the drive to sustain growth, which is high-tech innovation and knowledge-based value creation. So I'd like to focus on this, and this is what I refer to as the SMT, or the Science and Technology Innovation Ecosystem which I am submitting to you, the Philippines really has a desperate need for. So what is an s and or Science and Technology Innovation Ecosystem? Um, to define this, I'd like to refer to a tropical rainforest, which is the most common understood uh, ecosystem. A tropical rainforest is a dynamic and interactive environment that produces and sustains a rich variety of species which constitutes the innovation of the rainforest ecosystem. In this ecosystem, you know, there's soil, there's sunlight, there's rain, there's temperature, there's humidity, habitat, other species, and all of those interact and become responsible for the production of this rich variety of species that are unique to that particular tropical ecosystem. Well, there's another type of ecosystem which is a business ecosystem, which is an innovation <coughs> ecosystem. And of course, the archetype for this is Silicon Valley. I'm not suggesting that the Philippines should copy exactly Silicon Valley here. That's not possible. Uh, that is because Silicon Valley is a dynamic and interactive product of a rich variety of technology products and services, uh, which are produced by companies, universities, researchers, engineers, students, investors, government, research centers, global partners, etc. And, and that mix creates uh, that particular business environment of Silicon Valley. So these are the two ecosystems as analogies. The first one is tropical rainforest, and the innovation is a rich variety of species. And then you have the science and technology innovation ecosystem, where the innovation is a rich variety of science and technology products and services. So why does the Philippines need a science and technology innovation ecosystem? Well, quite simply, that's because spending in science and technology is a deliberate business investment. It's a national business investment. 
is a science that is a business for the people, and hence there must be a return on investment. And the return on investment is economic growth and national competitiveness. So when we talk about national investment in science and technology, we're mainly talking about science and technology capacity building and science and technology innovation readiness, and we expect this to naturally result in economic growth and national competitiveness, which issues in all of these benefits. Local jobs for science and technology, technology advancements, foreign direct investments, research funding, public-private partnerships, and so on and so forth. The only problem is, in the Philippines, not all of these are happening, or they're happening but not to the desired level. So there is a missing link. And the missing link is a science and technology innovation ecosystem. All right. So we can examine this um, uh, I the innovation ecosystem from the perspective and su of supply and demand. Um, there is a, a missing thing there um, on the upper part, but that's okay. So this is the um, this is the supply side of the ecosystem, and this one is the demand side. So the supply side takes care of the Philippine S and T programs, mainly carried out or implemented by the Department of Science and Technology, as well as CHET. Commission on Higher Education. Thank you. So uh, they uh, basically take care of improving science and technology education, developing R&D capacity, innovation readiness, and of course producing graduates in the science and technology fields. Uh, based on the Commission on Higher Education from 2016 to 2017, that's the latest um, statistics available. The Philippines is producing about 120,000 graduates per year in science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, as well as agriculture. The unfortunate thing is that a significant portion of these graduates cannot be gainfully employed in the Philippines. And so a good number of them end up leaving the country and working abroad. Now that's a loss for the Philippines. Uh, the opportunity cost for that is high because instead of those experts uh, creating value within the country, creating wealth within the country, it's the other countries that benefit from their expertise and their talents. Uh, and that's because the demand side is pretty anemic. So in terms of local enterprises and in terms of global companies that are currently around uh, that are employing science and technology graduates, uh, th there's not enough to be able to absorb the graduates. And so the result is brain drain. So how do we remedy this situation? Well, we have to do some harmonizing here between the supply side and the demand side. And that's where the development of a science and technology innovation ecosystem comes in, which is essentially uh, the expansion of this portion here, where in addition to local enterprises, we have to attract global companies that are science and technology in nature uh, so that they can set up shop here, do their operations here, hire graduates from the Philippine universities in science and technology, and desirably perform commercial R&D. And, um, and of course, this can be accomplished by having global partners. And of course, with this developed, then it will attract more foreign direct investments. And of course, this will require the cooperation of the government, private enterprises, as well as universities. And I just want to emphasize, so uh, this part here, the supply side, they're mainly facilitated by the Department of Science and Technology and the Commission on Higher Education. Uh, but on the demand side, there is the Board of Investment, Department of Trade and Industry. I should add PESA, but also in cooperation with the OSD and CHEP. All right, so I'd like to paint to you an architectural profile of Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem. Uh, this is one snapshot of uh, the Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem. So you've got these uh, clusters, industry clusters. You've got semiconductor chips cluster, and those are representative companies. There are others. Software and internet, you've got Google and Facebook. Smart gadgets, of course there's Apple and Samsung, health and biomedical, 
Amgen and Genentech and others. So my question to you is, how would you imagine a Philippine s and ecosystem uh, looking like? How would that look like? So of course, it would look like this. But what are these clusters? Well, the first cluster that I would submit to you is the IT Business Process Management, which already is in existence. And it's pretty successful, actually, very globally competitive. So if you look closer into that, these are the sub-clusters within the business process management. Of course, you've got your voice-based uh, call centers. Uh, but in addition to that, you've got finance, logistics, and accounting. You've got software development and animation cluster, legal and medical transcription clusters, and others. So these are S and T areas that can actually use uh, a lot of the graduates from the Philippines. But there are emerging S and T innovation clusters as well. And one of the biggest one is manufacturing. And to the credit of the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, they launched this um, industry roadmaps initiatives back in 2012. Uh, they regathered the Industry Development Council in 2014, and currently there's a manufacturing resurgence uh, program that is sponsoring uh, with the goal that uh, the manufacturing sector would increase its contribution to the GDP uh, to 30% by 2025 and contribute 15% of the country's total employment by 2025. There's also this observation that uh, the development of the manufacturing sector promotes inclusiveness uh, because it can harm people you know, without necessarily having that high of educational attainment compared with other sectors. Okay, but these are some of the industries that BTI are currently promoting. Uh, for the Philippine s and manufacturing subclusters, you've got automotive and um, Jaime Ayala mentioned this, uh, actually it's one of the initiatives within the Ayala group. Electronics and electrical, aerospace parts, chemicals, food processing, biotechnology and biomedical, and even shipbuilding. So if all these subsectors could really be developed um, in cooperation, with a deepened cooperation between the Department of Trade and Industry and the Department of Science and Technology, then this would be really a great opportunity for the Philippines. Uh, the crucial key, though, is that it shouldn't be just manufacturing, but it should include R&D. And so there has to be incentives uh, that are basically dangling by, or dangled by the Department of Trade and Industry, as well as PESA, for global companies uh, to be attracted to set up shop here in the Philippines within all of these subsectors, uh, so that this could um, prosper within the country. And again, I just want to emphasize that uh, these five steps of economic development, uh, the last two steps, this constitute your innovation ecosystem. And, and that's where the application of the fourth industrial revolution uh, technologies would actually take place. So without this, <laughs> It's going to be hard for the Philippines to make adjustments toward the fourth industrial revolution. It first has to have this ecosystem. All right, and I just want to emphasize that this will require a three-way nexus among the government, industry, and universities. So there's the government, the companies, are in the universities and centers, and they mutually collaborate, and that will result in sustained value creation. Value creation is just innovation. And again, these are the different uh, government agencies um, that uh, would be responsible for uh, making this happen. So what I really would like to put out as a message to you is that the Philippines requires a deepened cooperation among these government agencies and research universities and institutions to make this all happen. Not one uh, agency is able to make this happen. There has to be this deep end uh, collaboration and cooperation for this to take place. Okay, um, I just wanna show you some pictures here. Uh, I was in Israel last uh, June, and 
I had the opportunity to visit one of their e innovation ecosystems, which is represented by one of their natural zones. This is a friend and colleague of mine, Zvi Herman. Uh, he used to be with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel and the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, so this is a, an industrial zone, which is called Airport City, which is right next to uh, the Tel Aviv International Airport. And of course, you've got these brand, uh, brand names here like Motorola. And they're still doing manufacturing in Israel. It's not just design, it's not just innovation, but they're also producing uh, chips actually for export from Israel. Of course, you've got Siemens, AT&T, Unilever, um, and of course, there's the Israel Innovation Authority, uh, which really is uh, facilitating the building of these innovation ecosystems in the country. And here are some three examples of Israeli innovation clusters. One is automotive, and you, they've got all of these con uh, companies, Coral, uh, to work within that subsector. And you've got agritech, and also cybersecurity. All right. And again, the way that the Israeli government maintains focus on building these s and innovation ecosystems is through an agency called the Israel Innovation Authority, which coordinates uh, the various ministries within the country that has to do with uh, science and technology and innovation. In Palestine, I was in the West Bank last year and also this June. Uh, this is the West Bank. And of course, in the West Bank, there are more limitations. You've got this uh, Area A, which is Palestinian control, Area C, which is Israel control. You've got military checkpoints. Uh, you've got Israeli settlements. So there's a lot of challenges for Palestinians to create their own innovation ecosystem. One thing that uh, you can observe is this within the Israeli settlements within the West Bank, they have their own industrial zones. So they're very mindful about developing their innovation ecosystems. But the Palestinians, given those limitations, they still have to develop their own innovation ecosystems just the same. And the way that the government does that is through the Higher Council for Innovation and Excellence. They invited me there last year for a conference, and this is President Mahmoud Abbas. And so I'm collaborating with the Higher Council and we co-established what we call the um, Palestine Joint Center for, of Excellence uh, for Strategic Arab Food and Body Production, which is a small component of what they hope to accomplish as their innovation ecosystem. Okay, so again, this is my main message here. <laughs> and um, I'm happy that on Friday morning I'll be meeting with uh, BTI Undersecretary uh, Perry Rodolfo. Uh, so that we can talk about this. But actually, BTI and the OST are now talking with one another. They have a memorandum of agreement uh, to have this deep and cooperation to establish these uh, innovation ecosystems in the Philippines. Thank you so much. I'm left handed, so I'm going to stand over here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, thank you to PIDS for inviting me. Um, um, this is a really interesting topic. I think it's a very topical topic. Um, and um, I'm going to talk a bit about what's happening around the world. I'm going to talk about what's happening with Fourth Industrial Revolution. I'm going to talk a bit about what we did in the Philippines. Uh, until recently, I was chief of party of the Stride program. I'm not anymore, which is good. It means I can say what I think. I don't have to, <laughs> don't have to stick to the USA the script. I'm also heading to the airport straight after this, so I can say what I like and then just, <laughs> just go for it, yeah? So maybe I won't hold back. Um, okay, I have no clicker, thank you. <coughs> so so we've seen, we see pictures of the first Industrial Revolution, second, third, so, it's like, so I'm not gonna do that, but I like this slide. Um, this is about rate of change, yeah? And this is what my talk is about, is about how things are changing so fast that it's actually quite scary, and so it's actually time to, it's actually beyond time to do something. I'm not going to go through all of this, but just for example, 3D printing in 2007 
would have cost you about $40,000 for a 3D printer. Uh, now you can get for about $100 here. The price has gone down. Same with all of these things, robots, drones, uh, we saw Dr. Dadios talking about drones. They're really, really cheap. We can all buy them in shops. Um, somewhere down there, 3D LiDAR sensors. $20,000 in 2009, $79 in 2014. They're in many, many cars now, yeah? So all of this is what used to be high-tech. It used to be expensive. It used to be in the domain of clever scientists, yeah? But now it's not. It's in the domain of all of us, and we can all do something with it, and even if we don't as individuals, then companies and industry can do that. But the fact is, this is developing, the technologies are developing in a technical sense, but also reducing in price faster than our knowledge is developing. And that's the scary thing, yeah? So, what we learn today, what we teach today, is redundant tomorrow. And I have a couple of quotes coming up in a moment, yeah? Um, and so it's not what we learn, it's about how we relearn, yeah? Here's a quote, uh, OECD. Uh, because of rapid economic and social change, schools have to prepare students for jobs that have not yet been created. And you've all seen lists of jobs that don't exist yet that our children will do whenever they graduate, yeah? Technologies that haven't been invented, and problems that we don't yet know will arise, yeah? The question about this morning about um, legislation, yeah? Um, I found really interesting because legislation moves really slowly, yeah? And it's already changing too slowly for technology, which is why Uber has a problem all around the world. Uh, drones will have a problem as well, in fact, because there's no legislation uh, relating to what you can and can't do with a drone almost anywhere in the world, yeah? So things are changing so fast, they're changing faster than we can legislate for. It's time for, time for innovative legislation, I think was the way I described it this morning, yeah? So this is difficult. We're preparing our workforce for something we don't even know what it is. This, I think, was Klaus Schwab. I'm not sure, yeah? 50% of subject knowledge acquired by a student in the first year of a four-year technical degree will be outdated by the time they graduate, yeah? Everything I learned in my degree is outdated now, yeah? <laughs> That's why I'm described as an economic development specialist rather than an engineer, which is what I was trained, trained to do. I like this graph. This is really old. This came, this is 1982, if you see at the bottom. Um, I'm going to stand over here. No, no, I'm not. I'm going to try and point. Um, there we go. So this is a rate of change model. And we can apply it to technology, yeah? So it gets more complex. I don't know. It gets more complex. There we go. That one there. Um, the rate of change increases. And what's interesting is the ability of organizations to respond. And if you can respond, then you continue to go up. And if you can't respond, you go down. And that's the innovate or die um, situation, yeah? So we have to know how to respond to this increasing, changing complexity and in completing, complete, com increasing uh, rate of change. Not on the slide, because I only read it about two days ago, another World Economic Forum uh, statistic, and this was Klaus Schwab. Um, fourth Industrial Revolution will lose 75 million jobs worldwide. Yeah? It's really scary. But what he says, and, and he seems to know what he's talking about, is there is an opportunity for nearly double that to create if we do the right things globally, if we train and educate the right way fast enough, fourth industrial revolution, like all the other industrial revolutions, will actually create more jobs than it loses, just it will create different jobs than the ones it loses. So that's what's really important about today. So this is the challenge. Um, how can the Philippine workforce keep up with the ever-increasing complexity and rate of change driven by fourth industrial revolution? Maybe the last quote, because I'm not filling much presentation with quotes. I like this one. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. That is the skill that we need to be teaching our young people. Okay, I'm going to go back and then come back to that one, yeah? So, um, we heard this morning about how industry and technology are moving ahead, yeah? We referred a number of times to the fact that we need to reach, to train people the right way, to educate them the right way. So to me the message is we have to have universities and industry working much more closely together to feed the needs of industry 
um, and to keep the supply of workforce in an appropriate way moving forward. So the key to that, I think, is industry engagement. I've spent a lifetime doing it. It's getting very interesting now, yeah? So industry engagement. Um, we spent a lot of time on the STRIDE program doing this to try and get collaborative research between universities and industry. Like I say, I've spent a lot of time in my life doing this. I'm going to run through some examples of the kind of things we did on STRIDE, the kind of things that are happening around the world, but then I'm going to tell you about what's happening in Malaysia. And what I hope is that this is a message that gets through to, to the powers that be in the Philippines. So let's see. Before I do this, though, when I say this to <coughs> universities in particular, um, many of them say, well, we already do this. We've got an industry engagement here. What's the problem? We do this, yeah? So I tend to ask them these questions. This is when I'm in my awkward frame of mind, yeah? So what percentage of students in your university have one-year paid internships? Hardly any, I think, yeah? That was the norm where I got. We made it the norm. It wasn't the norm when I started. It was the norm when we finished. How often does industry review your curriculum? How often do you invite them into your university to review your curriculum? Hardly ever, I think, yeah? How many undergraduate projects come from industry? How many industrialists teach your courses? Here's a good test. If I walked into your university and said, can you set up an in a visit to one of your industry partners this afternoon, yeah? Could you do that? I visited NC State University with uh, Secretary Lopez and Yusei Guevara and a few people. NC State University got us into ABB within 15 minutes, yeah? And we just sprang it on them, somebody asked. We visited the ABB Research Center at NC State within 15 minutes. To me, that's industry engagement, yeah? Um, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go through all of them. The bottom one's really important, yeah? I was taught by one of my mentors that industry collaboration relies on you making friends with industry, yeah? Don't worry about the collaboration, first of all. Make friends. It's a bit like marriage, yeah? Don't marry someone who's not your friend, yeah? <laughs> a, a, no, I haven't learned that through experience. <laughs> that sounded like it. Um, so here's some things that we've, we're doing already, but this is because we're behind. I, I've been in the Philippines for over five years, yeah, and I've kind of lived in universities, and um, so we've been doing these things. Guest industry lectures, getting industry into universities. It's a small thing, it's the beginning of a friendship. It doesn't cost anything, you've just got to ask people, yeah? We used to pay for coffee and donuts, that's the only subsidy we gave, yeah? Faculty immersion. Getting faculty into companies to do work. In the UK, the Fellowship of Engineering, I think they are, they pay six months for faculty to go back into industry so they can keep up with what's happening. We paid like three or four weeks to put faculty into industry. Um, this was an initiative that they did down in Iloilo. Ilo Ilo. Um, there's a thing called a million cups in the US. It actually originated in North Carolina, which is where our headquarters are. And it's about universities drinking a million cups of coffee with industry and entrepreneurs. It's an excuse to get together. So my good friend Mel Ambut, who's Vice Chancellor of Research at Iloilo Science and Technology University, he heard about this. He understood Iloilo is not the United States of America, but he started something called a thousand cups. He thought if we could drink a thousand cups in Iloilo, that was a good start. Yeah? It's a way to bring people together. These are things we could, should be doing now, should have been doing some time ago. Innovation workshops brings industry and researchers together to talk about challenges. We did these as well, we're continuing to do them in the new stride. Um, we even mentored career centres, and you kind of might think, what's the point of that? You know, it helps graduates get jobs, what's it got to do with the fourth industrial revolution? If a university needs to make contact with an industry, what better way to do it than through a career centre? Yeah? And as an aside, if we judged our universities in the Philippines on graduate employment rate, all of a sudden every university would have a top-class, world-class career centre, wouldn't they, yeah? with great industry contacts. <clears throat> we also set up knowledge and technology transfer offices to better service people outside the university, to help universities work with external stakeholders. We started with 10, and we mentored another 29, I think, yeah? And along with DOSTs, TTBDIs, and field devs, and keep incubators, and such like, there's a great community growing out there of outward-facing faculty in universities, all looking to collaborate. This is great. 
It's a bit late, but it's great. Yeah. In the, I'm not going to go through all this slide, don't worry. Yeah? The European Commission do a Factories of the Future project, which encourages universities to collaborate with industry. It's been going on for some time. We're not even close. I'm going to come to what we need to do about it. Um, in the USA, they have the USA Innovation Institutes, all across the US, institutes that bring industry and academe together. So they can learn together, so that they can work together, so curriculum can move forward together, so faculty can use equipment in industry, so you don't have to keep buying new equipment for your university, which is pretty expensive. Um, uh, connects SMEs together with each other, with, with universities, a whole ecosystem, if you like, of collaboration. Here's an example from Oregon. I have no idea why anybody would want to go to Oregon, but anyway. Um, here's an example from Oregon. The Nanoscience and Microtechnologies Institute, something aimed at bringing a cluster together, a local ecosystem, if you like, in Oregon. So these are, this, I could go on all day with these kind of examples. Here's a really good one, and I know about this because I, I did this, I worked on these. This is a British thing, I'm not American, you may have guessed, yeah, it's a British thing. <coughs> Knowledge Transfer Partnerships, been going since 1975. It's the only government initiative, other than the National Health Service, I think, which has been going for that long, yeah? Nothing else lasts that long. So this must be good. It was known as Teaching Company Scheme at the beginning, because it was based on the teaching hospital model, yeah? That used to exist in universities. Um, but now, at any time, there are around 1,000 knowledge transfer partnerships in operation in the UK. And there's only about 110 universities there, yeah? There's not very many universities. Um, and what it is, it's a partnership between a company and a university to solve a problem for the company and it employs a recent graduate who does the work, yeah? And is supervised by people from the company and the university. It's a great learning process for the university faculty. That's what I did. I learned an awful lot. Um, and I worked on like six or eight of these over the years and set up more. Um, and it brings in equipment, it brings in expertise and it brings those friendships. You are, the university understands the problems of industry. The young graduate or graduates, because there could be more than one, they know what industry wants. They're starting to move at the beat of the drum of the fourth industrial revolution. These don't cost very much money. They pay mostly for a bit of the faculty, time, and the, uh, the young graduate. Uh, industry puts in its own contribution. You're talking about a uh, subsidy from government of like 30, 40,000 pounds, which is like 50, 60,000 dollars, I think, yeah, <laughs> per year, on usually two year programs. The Australians copy this, the Swedes copy it. It's one of the best models I've ever come across for university industry collaboration. Lastly, before I move on to what I think the Philippines needs to do, um, NC State University is one of the universities, the university at the corner of Research Triangle Park, which is where our headquarters is based. They have a campus called Centennial Campus. It's absolutely brilliant, yeah? They have academic facilities next to industrial facilities. That's how we got into ABB. We were meeting in the library at NC State, which is an amazing automated thing with with vehicles and lifts and things, it's amazing. And across the road was the ABB research facility. Um, and it's a big place, but there's industry all over it. And a condition of them occupying the space there is that they do something with the university. They either take, um, what do they call here, um, internships or, or whatever, yeah? Or they work on joint research or something like that. They have to do something with the university. Then they get a relatively preferential rate, but of course they benefit from working with all the smart people in the university. Centennial Campus, um, 70 industry partners, 75 university centres, 7,000, it's like a university campus, yeah, but it's got industry dotted around all over it. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, we took um, Secretary Lopez, Yusek Gev, Vasek Fita, and various people there in last year or the year before. And I know we're taking, well, we're not filled every fact of taking somebody there later, later this year. Um, so now, here, here this, is, this is the scary thing now. So that was a bit scary, yeah? Because really, Philippines could and should have been doing all the things I've been talking about, yeah? But, but, but there's resistance to change. It's not easy to make things happen quickly in the Philippines, yeah? Um, recently, I went to Malaysia. Um, 
And I consider Malaysia similar, yeah? It's a bit kind of further ahead on the development curve. They had the benefit of oil money and things like that. Um, but if you scratch the surface underneath, it's not too different from the Philippines. Um, the Philippines have redesigned their, higher their national higher education strategy to meet the needs of the fourth industrial revolution. They've called it AG 4.0. And that picture on there is the front cover of a 160-page document downloadable from the internet, it's in the public domain, uh, describing what Malaysia is going to do about addressing the fourth industrial revolution. That's what we're here to talk about today. Yeah? It's a really good document. I'm really impressed by it. Um, so they're reinventing higher education to address fourth industrial revolution. They're doing, they're pushing the boundary further than I've seen. Uh, they're breaking down traditional university structures and they're merging education and workforce development with industry so it becomes a seamless thing. I'm just going to give you brief descriptions. <coughs> so those circles around the circle, those are initiatives. And I don't even know what half of them are. I haven't had time to read it. And I learned about these when I was there. So earlier I asked the question, how many students do we have on a one-year paid internship in the Philippines? The answer is virtually none. Yeah? Um, I hear awful, terrible excuses saying, oh, an industry doesn't want to take them. Yeah? Um, if industry doesn't want to take them, it means there's no jobs for them, really. Yeah? So that needs an even bigger rethink. But the fact is, universities don't sell their students to industry. Yeah? I worked in a university in the UK in uh, as far back as the mid-80s. Hardly any of our students had internships then. When I studied at um, Loughborough University, one of the best engineering schools, I had to find my own internship, yeah? And I didn't, I didn't succeed, it's, it's almost impossible. Um, so, um, the university I went to, we went out and we sold internships, we sold the idea, we pushed it, we marketed it, yeah? When I left there, every single student had an internship. In Malaysia, 2U2I is two years in university, two years in industry. That's a model for getting a degree. That's how you get in tune with what industry is doing. I know I'm running out of time, but I'm going to go very fast here. Yeah? Uh, MOOC is massively open online courses. They're pushing that in a big, big way. APEL, Accreditation of Prior Experience and Learning. We talk about it here, but you can almost get a whole degree there by getting accreditation for things you've done in the past. Yeah? You could just do a few courses, move things forward. Um, getting CEOs in to talk. But also, what they're talking about is the idea that you might study for six months and then go and work. But then you need to re-study, you need re-accrediting as a professional engineer or whatever, breaking down the barriers. There's four different models of universities there, ranging from no change through to radical change. Uh, it's a government-wide um, initiative. It's worth taking a look at, yeah? So finally, there, very fast, yeah? Conclusions. This is what I think Philippines needs to do. And in a public policy conference, this is what we should be taking on board, yeah? We need to resolve to reinvent tertiary education. And before Jaime Isabel Ayala said it this morning, I wrote up there to include TVEC, Technical and Vocational Education. Should be seamless, yes. Yeah, well, the problem lies back in basic education, yeah? Um, accept the concept of lifelong learning. My last PhD student never studied full-time in his life, yeah? Studied all the way through, didn't have a degree either, had a bachelor's degree, studied part-time all the way through. One of my best ever PhD students, based in industry. Involve industry in curriculum development and delivery. Thank you, time's up. Accept and encourage industry accreditation. Every program should be accredited by industry. And this is the terrible thing I have to say. I don't care about the PRC and, and, and what they say, yeah? What I care about is whether industry thinks graduates are acceptable or not, and the curriculum can change at that speed. Um, encourage and explore novel university industry education and re-education models. Break down the traditional degree model. Enable and encourage rapid revision of content. Be able to change next year's curriculum like that, yeah? With appropriate approvals, but not going round and round and round. Fully embrace continual, continuous professional development. If you don't, then you become disqualified from being a professional engineer. And accept that part-time study will be the norm rather than unusual. So that's it. I'm sorry, I'm a minute over, but I had a lot to say, didn't I? So thank you. Maramin Salamat. Thank you very much, Lisa Carroll. Uh,
the ideas. Thank you for having me here. Uh, in my talk, let me hopefully share a perspective on this fourth industrial revolution, perhaps something that uh, you may have heard this morning, but I'll try to give a different view, an additional view. And uh, I was listening to the previous presentations, of course, talking about what can be done in the Philippines. Let me, let me try to take you to the weeds and uh, at the same time soar above the weeds to see what's actually happening um, with, with uh, this agency of ours called the Advanced Science and Technology Institute, or ASTI, uh, which has been around for 31 years now. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm on secondment to DOSD ASTI. I'm from the UP, so I listen very intently to what David says. It's always difficult to follow a very eloquent Englishman, but I'll try my best. Okay, let me get started now. Let me take you to a journey of computing. First of all, it all goes back to these uh, pictures, you know, these old, uh, I don't know what you call it anymore, but uh, we've seen the personal computing era, uh, right? And that's really what this third industrial revolution is about. It's about automation through computers that can process information faster, right? Um, these computers uh, with uh, able to execute commands faster than any human can was able to give uh, enhanced productivity. But then, <clears throat> from these personal computers, we started with increasing connectivity and with more processing power. We put computers in remote places called data centers. So we see them, we refer to them as being in the cloud. Like uh, data centers, server farms, etc., powered 24-7 by air conditioning, backup electricity. You see pictures like these rows and rows of computers. And they're even building, um, probably makes sense for the Philippines to do something like this, build a data center underwater. Um, you know, uh, but in some places they consider that bad, a good idea because you can put it near the urban areas where really the demand for computing is uh, high. Now when you talk about computing, you don't necessarily have to be doing some fancy simulation now. You don't necessarily have to be doing graphics <coughs> or some scientific simulation. You can be logging on to Facebook sending out a tweet, you're contributing data that's being computed. Uh, somewhere out there, your tweet goes to a server, processes it, parses it, etc., presents it in a certain way, so you're adding traffic on the network, you're adding computational load, uh, burden, they call it social computing. <clears throat> and computers themselves, if we still think of computers as these dull, uh, gray and black, boring boxes, that sit on our desks and our laps, that's, that's really old school. Computers now fit in the palm of our hands, they're becoming more <coughs> embedded in our environment. Soon they'll be in our clothing, they already are in our wrists, they're in our pockets, they'll be in our clothes. Right? You probably won't expect, don't expect to see computers in a motorcycle, but this is a picture from a decade ago by Intel. From the um, from monitoring of the engine, from the braking mechanism to the GPS that's in there. Computers are everywhere. And let me tell you where else. In space. Uh, we talked about launching the Philippines' first microsatellite. Uh, we embed computers in space. What am I talking about? That, that box has six computers inside of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, or oh, seven computers inside of it, doing things like controlling the payload cameras, communicating with the ground radio stations, pointing the satellite to its intended target so it can take a proper picture. So those are all con controlled by computers, and computers are up there for the purpose of getting data. Okay, so we talk about embedding computers in space. We're not really launching satellites. You know, if you, that's my perspective of it. What are we doing here? We're putting computers in orbit. That, that's my view, and that's what our team believes when we're doing when we're going into space technology. As you know, part of this industrial revolution that's happening, that's really all about data. That's really all about computation and the fusion of technologies that would uh, lead to so-called cyber physical systems. <clears throat> so what for? I mentioned data. That's what we're doing when we put these satellites in space. This data that fuels the upcoming fourth industrial revolution. So we come from this era of mainframes. That's died, right? This is time, and that's like penetration. The mainframe era, it's really a paradigm for one massive computer serving many people. 
only because people could not afford having their own computers then. But then the advent of personal computing right here means that it became affordable for each person to have one in their home, to have one in the factory, to have one in their business. That's the personal computing era. And so we have entered this era called ubiquitous computing, where the paradigm is many computers to one person. So we probably sitting there, you have a couple of computers with you, um, maybe three, if you've got a globe phone and a smartphone with a dual SIM, those are computers. And you talk back to the commercial of Nokia more than a decade ago when they announced their phone model and the tagline was, this is what computers have become. Right? And that's that really resonated with me when I, when I saw that. Okay. And computers are going the way of the light bulb. What does that mean? Um, you know, it's vanishing. It's disappearing into the background. If you talk about the light bulb, it represents electricity. So we go someplace, uh, before it was pretty exclusive, but it's now vanished into the background. That means you go someplace and there's no electricity, we complain that we see, this is such a backward place. Why is there no electricity or this reliable electricity here? Uh, uh, you know, when we were connecting rural schools to the internet in some of the places in the Philippines, um, the only time you get clean electricity is when there is no electricity. Do you see what I mean? Because when there's no electricity, we use batteries. And batteries provide stable, clean electricity that will not damage the computers. You might as well take your computers, your PCs that you give to the public schools, out of the grid because when the, whenever the electricity comes back up and causes a surge, computers get fried. Your UPS will not be able to prevent it. So the only time we get clean power is when we take them off the grid and put them, hook them to our batteries and charge controllers. Okay. So um, another kind of technology that you know, we take for granted now is Wi-Fi. You know, we go to some place and there's no Wi-Fi or maybe we have to pay for it. Right? What? Right? Okay, anyway. I have a quote too, David. Uh, this is from Mark Weiser. Um, the most, I, I keep shopping this around, and the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. He's talking about computing, um, being in the background. Okay. He's the so-called father of ubiquitous computing. So we, do we mean computers literally vanishing? Uh, no, no, that's not what we mean. We mean, these technologies are being fused and they blend into the background. They melt into the background. And what you're seeing is a merger of the physical world with the so-called cyber world. And that is that underpins what we call cyber physical systems. <clears throat> cyber physical what? You know? This is a simpli uh, simplified illustration of that. Oops. You have a physical plant, maybe the power grid or the water distribution system or maybe even just the, 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 the processes in your factory. And you have the cyber part, computers, networks, the internet, um, communication uh, protocols, etc., signal processing techniques, all of that being blended together, interacting, almost being indistinguishable individually, rather being fused together as one completely functional and better whole. Uh, that, that's, it's, the sum is much greater than its parts. And that interface is through sensors and actuators. <coughs> sensors are these devices that we can use to monitor the condition of the physical world. Right? When we put sensors in this room to monitor temperature. I remember when, when we, we were in Berkeley uh, more than a decade ago, there, was can, there were cans of paint in the lab. And so I was curious, I asked the guys, what sort of these kinds of things do we Oh, we're, 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 we have these uh, dust sensors. And so we're mixing them in the paint later. Um, and then we're going to paint the wall. And when you paint the wall, the sensors are embedded in the wall. And the sensors get powered by ambient vibrations. As if somebody walks by, causes vibrations, they get powered up, they sense the presence of a person in the room Right? And they talk to each other using very low power techniques and then all of a sudden the light turns on. Right? Uh, or it illuminates your path as you walk by. So pretty novel stuff, interesting stuff. Okay, and um, you see here physical sensing. You have the real world, the real space, houses, uh, transportation networks or cars being fitted with gadgets. 
right? The car now, and you know, you heard, probably heard about Toyota remanufacturing itself, not as a car company, but rather as a mobility company, right? Um, you have the car itself as a computer on wheels, right? And you have these computers in these systems that generate data, have sensors <coughs> processed by computers, and they bring it, bring those measurements to the cloud, right? And from the cloud, we can actuate and control certain devices to effectuate better performance in some parameter. Yeah. Okay. So that's really now what this fourth industrial revolution is about, cyber physical systems. Uh, so this is a perspective that I'd like to share here. It's really a melding of what we recognize as physical plants, physical systems, things we already know and we use, but making them more efficient, more reliable, more accurate, and more productive because of the fusion of uh, information technologies and techniques, computing, data, sensors, etc. So to bring about um, this uh, revolution. Okay, so it's an explosion of devices here. Internet of Things is another buzzword in, under the um, uh, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, here, this is a slide I borrowed from a, a, a Berkeley professor here. Uh, the size, cost per item, power, you have different layers here of the Internet of Things. You have the nodes, which are seen to grow in the trillions in terms of volume. These are very small devices embedded in the environment, very cheap, low power. And then they talk to gateways that aggregate the data and then bring them at the cusp of the global internet. So you have these gateways and concentrators. These are also devices perhaps in our person, right? Uh, our cell phones, our tablets, etc. Billions of them are very portable, cheap, low power as well. And then you talk about these compute servers in the cloud somewhere that take all of that data, fuse the data, from different sources and make the machines smarter. This is what now we call machine learning and artificial intelligence that provides actionable information in a feedback loop. <clears throat> an explosion of devices. Now what's behind this explosion? This is a little bit of the weeds. We have three laws in engineering that we, uh, it's like our Bible in some sense. Now you've probably heard about Moore, Moore's law. You probably have not heard about Shannon, unless maybe some of you are students of computer science or electrical engineering, and, but you've probably heard of Everready. Uh, um, <coughs> what is Moore's Law? Now, I'm not going to be very technical, but Moore's Law basically represents the capability of computers. Right? So it's one top. You know, we are, we are uh, then what is Shannon? Uh, Shannon is about algorithmic complexity. When you think of something to do, you devise an algorithm, and the more complex that you want something, you want something to be more complex and more complex than algorithm is. So what this is saying is that we're dreaming and thinking about more and more complicated things to do, and we're actually building the devices and hardware that can do it. But EverReady is not keeping up as, as fast as uh, we want. What is that? Battery capacity, right? So people in chemistry here, uh, you know, better work on those batteries and try to uh, provide as much compute power from our, for our processors with as little battery drain as possible and with longer battery life. So that, that's what it means. Okay. <clears throat> so thanks in part to Moore, Shannon, and uh, EverReady, we've seen cost of bandwidth storage and computing, this trifecta, all go down. Let me just highlight one thing here, probably something, something can relate to storage. In the 1970s, in order to get one megabyte of storage, one megabyte of storage in your pocket, it would cost you somewhere around 8,000 US dollars. One megabyte of storage. Now, it's almost insignificant now. I can't even fit my picture attachment in one megabyte. Uh, so that's done now. Uh, computing as well, this is the cost of one megahertz processor speed. Bandwidth is the cost of sending a trillion bits, all of them <coughs> going down. <coughs> So then, all these developments enable our computers to be increasingly at the edge of a network. So 
So when we talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, we usually perform these things in some remote cloud, very powerful computer, right? But the paradigm is shifting. There is a deep learning uh, ecosystem now where it's, we're getting, we're bringing this neural networks, this very heavy computation, closer to the edge in our devices. So that when, I'll give you an example of this, it's very quick, a traffic camera, right? It takes uh, the traffic camera and the traffic light, the tandem. So the traffic camera takes a picture of the, of the traffic, or it's a video of the traffic, and then it probably sends a video somewhere, and then it's processed, and then it maybe actuates the traffic lights, right? Uh, it could be done via some remote uh, system. But if you have that capability for this traffic light to learn, right, the traffic at the edge without necessarily having to transmit all of that data back to some cloud server, then we become more efficient and probably even more secure because the data doesn't have to travel very far. Um, it's, it remains local. So we have to reduce the latency of the control, those things. Okay, so object identification, things like this, um, when you identify, it's, it's actually very, it's not very straightforward to make computers recognize objects. Right? You have to train them to do it. Okay, now let me speed up because I have five minutes left. Now, let me talk about ASTI now and what we're doing. Um, the Advanced Science and Technology Institute maintains science infrastructure uh, with the funding from the Department of Science and Technology. Let me run through several of them here. And this is really also an invitation for everyone here to avail of these um, systems, facilities. Right? Let me go through some of them. So we have sensors all over the place. About 2,000 weather stations, water level monitoring systems. Not, not all of them work, actually. It's very hard to maintain them. As a research and development institute, one of our pain points is really going out in the field and trying to change a battery or trying to declot a rain gauge that has been filled up by debris, right? We are researchers. We are not really people who go out in the field to remove leaves from a rain gauge. Uh, we hope somebody else can help us do that, like the community. And we are increasingly, well, our success is increasing, but anyway, there's still challenges. That's the sensors. We have a ground station that communicates with satellite to get satellite images. And we have satellites, and we have soon we will deploy 50, 50 lightning sensors all over Metro Manila. And as far as I know, that's the densest deployment of lightning sensors anywhere in the world for the purpose of trying to measure and predict local thunderstorms. These are not the large weather, weather phenomenon that the Doppler radars of Pagasa will measure, rather localized phenomenon, especially during summer. So we have the Philippine Research, Education, and Government Information Network, or PREGINET, which is really a high-speed network for research and education. Although we do carry commodity internet traffic in there, because we can't tell the client, oh, we can't pass your YouTube traffic here, only your research traffic. But you know, but I don't need that. I need to connect to, the, to YouTube in order to in order to do my research. Okay. <clears throat> then on top of that, you have the computing and archiving research environment of CORE. CORE is our high performance computer, right? And uh, that's for storing, computing, and accessing the data. And then we have people, teams, that process the data to Datos and Alan to convert the data to information so you can address societal applications from traffic, industry IoT, telemedicine, rice research, disaster mitigation. Okay, this is a snapshot of the amount of data that we currently hold right from um, user data contributed by our virus users to our HPC, about 777 terabytes, Padasa data, sensor data, hazard mass, we host the LiDAR data, 3,000 rice genomes of uh, International Rice Research Institute and satellite images, those are all integrated into core. We offer the HPC I mentioned, storage, data storage, cloud service, and a data catalog. Okay. And our facility is housed in a, sorry, let me get to that picture. Maybe not. It's just a 40-foot container van behind our building. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show you. And this is uh, pictures of that inside, the number of cores in the facility. Okay, let me get to the message now. Okay. Uh, many of you might have heard of the PREGINET. We try to incur, we try to connect different research institutions across the country so that they can access information quickly. We host. Asking a cache for Google, 
Facebook, Akamai. So if you connect, if your ISP is peered with us, then you can access, you can do your Google searches faster, you can do your YouTube um, you know, viewing faster because we host the local cache. Uh, and that's a, that's a plus side of, of peering with our network. Our time's up. Um, two more videos. That's our container run. We're, we're expanding to a new site. Sorry. Connected by 10 gigabit bit per second, 11 gigabit per second, different sites. Capacity is increasing, but we, we need to do that. Okay. And we actually respond to operational needs. It's not just science and technology. Let me show you a quick example of this. Typhoon Mangkut. Uh, this is fresh of uh, our teams. So we were asked to provide satellite images of four regions. Region 1, 2, 3, and Cordillera administrative region, CAR. Okay. And uh, this is a sample of an image in Ringgit, high resolution, about 3.31 uh, meter resolution. Pre-disaster images, so that we serve as baseline. And after the typhoon passes, we can assess the change in the damage. And this is an example of our output trying to map the flooding that happens. I think this is in Cagayan, in Ilocos Norte. We've given this out to NDR and MC and to the OCP. So that's the information. So people there really were on storm watch and did not really have their weekends to them. And they were there 24 hours doing this thing. Uh, let me offer you a new metric for typhoons. I call it a data metric. A new way of categorizing typhoon. It corresponds to the amount of data we mobilize to prepare for a typhoon. In OMPOM, <coughs> amounted to about 8 terabytes of data. There were 8,000 gigabytes of data, mostly satellite images. The other side of it, the other side, the, the complementary part of this is the amount of compute resources. We have not quantified that yet. But maybe we can, for us in the data community, this is a new metric by which we can gauge typhoons. Of course, this is the first time we've done it. Maybe we'll go back and see how much we did for Lawin, etc., all those other typhoons, and then we'll share it in another form. But this is the breakdown of data that we used in order to enable the preparation and the pre-typhoon pre assessment of these communities for um, OMPO. Now, let me conclude. Computing becoming pervasive, powerful computers becoming more and more embedded in the environment. Embedded computers are vanishing. They are profound technologies that disappear into the fabric of everyday life. As computers and data become fused into physical processes, infrastructure. This fusion of the physical and cyber domains are cyber physical systems. It's an integration of computation, networking, and physical processes wherein really we blur the lines between the physical and digital spheres. The sensors enable us to do better and pervasive monitoring, actuators to provide more effective and responsive control, but we need feedback. The feedback or the measurement enables our systems to behave adaptively and to tweak themselves. And CPS is a highlight of the part. And finally, for ASTI, uh, the science infrastructure, uh, the sensors in place generate scientific big data for these various projects. Uh, there's a mechanism for storing, computing, and accessing the data through these facilities, processing the data information into information via these teams. And CORE provides the following services, preparing data in infra for the fire, available freely to Filipinos, with an asterisk to limit it to non-commercial use. Um, that is uh, one constraint that we have, but we always want to engage and look forward to engaging uh, different groups, whether you're commercial or academic or government, uh, talk to us after this. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. afternoon, I, uh, just a little bit of introduction. <coughs> Since last year, a team of fellows uh, comprising Dr. Monet Serafica, uh, Dr. Vic Pacquia, Dr. Uh, Babes Arbeta, and myself, together with um, Dr. Elmer Dadios is here. I'm not sure if I see uh, Dr. Alvin Colaba of uh, De La Salle. We work uh, on undertaking a scoping study of the fourth industrial revolution, which we branded at kids as fire. No? Uh, and so that's why uh, we finished already our scoping study just a few weeks ago. So it's up on our website at kids. And, and then uh, a few months, was it a few months or a week ago, uh, several months ago, we sort of suggested to Dr. Celia Reyes that we, perhaps the annual public policy conference would 
will feature uh, the fourth industrial revolution because this is big. You know, unfortunately, sometimes we uh, we get caught, caught up in in daily things that uh, you know, they firefighting, <laughs> uh, which uh, uh, like for instance, in, during our press conference uh, on the on, on this. Uh, uh, this policy development month. Sadly, sadly, uh, you know, we, I was wondering, how come the media wasn't paying attention as much to us, and then apparently it was because of the Trillianist thing, you know. So <laughs> maybe I should say whatever I say today. Uh, if I say certain things, this uh, there's a disclosure. Uh, whatever I say that might be off uh, color, uh, they they do not reflect uh, the views of the ideas. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Dr. Serafika and I uh, decided to write the, this part that I, uh, on from uh, from the scoping study to sort of think of uh, what is the overall role really of government. Of course, you might say we're not some of you may not be in government, but that's not the point. I mean, we we need to first identify what's what's the role of government in all of this. Uh, and as shown is in oh sorry, what did I press? Okay, uh, okay. So as shown is in this outline, allow me to describe very briefly, uh, the overall context of, the, of economic performance and how technology is driving a, a new momentum uh, and other likely eff uh, effects of uh, these frontier technologies before I actually talk about the innovation ecosystem. There, is, there actually is an innovation ecosystem in the Philippines. Maybe not as, as elaborate as in other countries, but you know, uh, and anyways, I'd, I'd like to share our views on what we see is possibly a ro the, the role of government as a gardener of innovation. <laughs> um, Okay, so while currently many of us hear uh, of political noise within the Philippines and outside the country, and we are aware that you know, we've had, we in the Philippines have had our share of booms and busts in economic performance in the past, with the economy getting hit not only from internal political events, but also regional shocks. But since 2012, the economy has had a new trajectory, you know, with our performance here doing even better than the average in the whole of East Asia and even the entire world. And uh, 10 years after the global financial economic crisis of 2008, we may wonder where we're heading. And many of the business in the business world actually have a very positive outlook. And you've heard it not just in the business community, but uh, uh, also from ADB's uh, chief economist, among others, uh, that there's a quite positive outlook uh, in the regional economy and even the world economy, uh, partly because of this emerging fourth industrial revolution. And historians of science would always uh, would point out that we've had many developments starting way back, uh, you know, as early as the invention of fire, and the development of agriculture, the use of the wheel, the rise of cities, the development of manufacturing trade. And in the case of industrial, of the industrial production, uh, there have been significant periods called industrial revolutions where we improved industry by migrating from established production methods to utilizing cutting-edge technology. First, we use steam and water power, then we use electricity and assembly lines. Then starting more or less in the 1970s, we, we have the third industrial revolution, which involved computerization. Now we live in the fourth industrial revolution. And what makes this a revolution is not the technologies themselves, because technically these were technologies that have been there for quite some time, even if you think of computers, wireless connectivity, digital platforms. But what makes this moment special is that we're getting to use these technologies to interact with each other in a way that we haven't done before. And Klaus Schwab, um, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, says this period is fusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds. While there's no universally agreed definition of what exactly are the frontier technologies that are part of fire, commonly we identify 3D printing, Internet of Things, AI, robotics, and the past session, and some of the talks here in this session and in other sessions, uh, by the way, I, I, I would have wanted, honestly, to also attend some of those other sessions. But what you can do is, as soon as you go home, you, there will be links to the other sessions. No? So they're all, they're all streamed, and you can, you can view them later. No? So I'd certainly like to see what's happening in the other sessions. But anyways, you're stuck here, so you listen to us. Uh, at this moment, many of the technologies that uh, people dreamed of in the 50s and 60s have already become a reality. And while we, we still don't have flying cars, I, I think that probably happened sometime, we're testing already driverless cars in many cities across the world, including next door neighbor Singapore. And while we have got them, we, and we have got robots, even, you know, even in the country, uh, plus there's genetic engineering and editing, AI, 
miniaturized sensors, 3D printing, Internet of Things, big data, blockchain, nanotechnologies, just to name a few of these frontier technologies. And um, uh, all of these can potentially already solve many of our problems that we face in making growth and prosperity and development more inclusive and sustainable, from attaining food security, to improving uh, uh, the quality of health, to caring better for the planet. No? Uh, and these are concerns, especially of our global aspirations to reach the, what are known as the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, improving nutrition and healthcare, re-engineering transportation and supply management, to addressing issues about urbanization and climate change. Even in the Philippines, we, as was mentioned earlier by Secretary Pernia, we do have our own long-term aspirations that are articulated in Ambition 2040. Smart systems are being used across homes, factories, farms, cities, you know, to tackle many issues. Uh, but while the fire will continue to bring a lot of good in the future, its technology is actually causing a lot of disruptions, and there are risks, whether we like it or not. I mean, you, you do, you, we'd like to be positive, but at the same time, you have to realize that, you know, technology isn't, isn't good in itself. It's how we use it. Uh, so there will be possibilities of misuse, and there will be unintended consequences, and these fire technologies can, uh, can yield all of these uncertainties. Uh, the late physicist Stephen Hawking, even suggested that AI will provide an existential threat to humanity. And even Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz warns that the current inequalities that we have in society will largely become larger because of the fire. Okay. So while every use of technology, while every use of technology, you know, we, we should realize there's, uh, maybe I should go back a little bit, uh, um, there's uh, yeah, you have many of these possible different uh, socioeconomic consequences, and even in security, you know, you think of possible things like you know fraud and, and you know, weaponization. I mean, I've been hearing so many of these things. I mean, on one level, there's you, you, we should be scared. You know? uh, there, there, there are possible misuses. Uh, even now, how much of Big Brother is watching you? you know? uh, uh, with all the, to some extent, you know people getting access to some of our personal information. It's there, you know? I mean, these, are, these, are, these, are, these are neither positive nor negative in itself, but they, it's the use of technologies that we have to be a little bit more cautious about. And, uh, and particularly for jobs, of course, we do know that uh, Sawada, ABB chief economist, so, so, uh, Sawada said, you know, uh, you know, fairly positive outlook, but technology will affect jobs in three different forms. Either technology replacing human labor, or new jobs will be created because of technology, or jobs will be complemented by technology. As well, and there were examples earlier given by Elmer, you know, possibilities of complementarities. But how exactly this is going to play out is still anybody's guess. A recent study of the ILO suggests that nearly half of our wages, wage workers are at high risk of getting affected, more women than men. And uh, you know, regarding POs in particular, about 9 out of 10 workers at high risk of getting affected. Of course, high risk doesn't necessarily mean they will all lose their jobs. No? Bank tellers in the 1990s when ATMs were invented, uh, you know, they didn't lose their jobs. We still have a lot of bank tellers around. In fact, more of them now. <laughs> because they were given other tasks to do, you know, uh, doing uh, customer relationship management. But there will be disruptions in business models that can trigger selective Reshoring, nearshoring, and other structural changes to build new value chains. So what this means for workers is both good news and bad news. Good news because technological advances will create new jobs, but it's also bad news because these new jobs are going to be different from the jobs that we currently have. And they will require workers to have, to, to have skills and you know, keep learning new skills. So it's a life, it should, there should be lifelong learning, essentially. MIT professor David Author, in fact, suggests, argues that the extent of machine substitution probably is a little bit overstated. Uh, computer substitute for workers in performing routine tasks, but they also am amplify the compa uh, comparative advantage of workers in supplying problem-solving skills. You know, there are certain soft skills that computers cannot substitute. <laughs> Creativity, you know. Um, so, however, he also adds that even if automation doesn't reduce the quantity of jobs, it may affect the quality 
of jobs that are available. And so this means the human capital investments are crucial and will form the form of, will form the core of any long-term strategy for pro producing future skills. I'm excited to know because I was looking at the the participants of this conference, and very few people, I mean, low-level people from DepEd and CHED. I was expecting a little bit more. Of course, there's a budget, you know, deliberations now, but I still had expected a few more people from them coming over to participate because this is really their responsibility, you know? And if they're not going to do it, at least you, there's some lot of people from academia here, you probably need to push them. <laughs> Push them more because we can't do all of these things on our own here at PIB. Yes, sometimes nobody listens to us. No, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the difficulty of being a policy researcher. Um, but you know, there are a lot of uncertainties in the future. We need to look into our innovation ecosystem, and uh, let me just put the context that you know that as we, if we're going to identify what are the steps we need to make, uh, we need to first see where, where where do we stand. And the World Economic Forum has started an assessment of the level of preparedness of 100 countries looking to various aspects of current structures of production as well as drivers of production. Seven ASEAN countries were included in the assessment and they were among different archetypes leading would be Malaysia and Singapore together with many rich countries in China. Legacy would be Philippines and Thailand and nascent would be Cambodia, Indonesia and Vietnam. So uh, countries in like Singapore and Malaysia, well, naturally they'd be leading because they, they were making a lot of prior investments in the innovation ecosystem. And I keep pointing out that China alone, they, they really said, you know, during the time when they opened their economy in the late 70s, they, uh, Ben Xiaoping was the one who asked Jimmy Carter, give me 10,000 scholarships in the best schools. I'll send my people there. So they're, they're reaping the benefits now. That's why you, you can see, you go to China, you talk with a professor from my university, he'll call the big, a big businessman and talk with him. I wonder how many of the professors sitting here in the, our university set up can call JASA. I mean, it took a while for us to penetrate him, by the way. Huh? And then, of course, he, he, said, he said, oh, you're very creative because like, there's so many people who are trying to tell me to come here. You know? But, you know, it took a while for us to get to him. So how many of you, if you're in academia, you just call Jaza and say, hey, hi, Jaza. <laughs> huh? that's, uh, that's the point that I have, and it's happening in China. Um, now, as a legacy country, the Philippines is found to have a stronger production base, but it's as at risk for the future of production due to weaker performance across drivers of production, which includes technology, innovation, human capital, global trade investment, institutional framework, sustainable resources, and the demand environment. Uh, some of us may, may, be, may be dreaming you know, of leapfrogging into technological frontiers, but we have to be aware that studies suggest that countries that are not in the front, forefront of science and technology and innovation will have difficulty catching up and leapfrogging. Because if you're going to just, in fact, I told this once during another armed forces meeting, well, even if we give, of course it's not science, no? <laughs> anyway, I said, even if government decides to give you all the money, can you really spend it? You have the absorptive capacity. I mean, even now, the OST, even if you're really gonna give you 10 times your budgets, can you, can you know, do you know how to spend it? It's not just about money, it's about many things. Eh? Uh, there are a lot of all of these um, issues that you need to sort of uh, work, it, work out. Um, recent data from, from both the PIDS, our, we conducted the survey, which was a follow-up of the survey we did with the OST on innovation activities. No? And uh, sadly to say, you know, less than half of firms are engaged in product innovation. But in fact, about a third, and uh, within a fourth or fifth spend on R&D, especially if you look at, uh, uh, well, even especially even if you compare the results with the World Bank's uh, World Enterprise Survey. Now, the, our PIDS survey uh, provides hard evidence of innovations actually is happening, but it's resulting in more in certain sectors, uh, particularly ICT, manufacturing sector, other than food. And uh, we noted that, you know, size really matters. I mean, if you have big companies like, you know, JASA's, <laughs> JASA is controlling so many firms, it's easier for them. But for MSMEs, it's much harder. You know, and large part because of capital and human resource constraints. So recent data, he also even suggests that we have Lots of problems about competitiveness, you know, uh, 
we we made strides the start you know starting a com a competition policy but uh uh i mean unfortunately sometimes we, we set up all of these regulatory frameworks and then they take a life of its own we just have too many lawyers i think no? <laughs> the problems. We have twice more lawyers than we have research scientists and engineers. That's the reality. I mean, and if you look at, I, I can compare ourselves with China. You look at the, the Chinese managers, many of them are engineers and scientists. They have backgrounds in engineering and science. And, and us, you look at Edison, is LLB, you know. So that's one of the problems we have. But then there was a question earlier in the morning. Can't we, can't we induce people to, 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 to study science? It's so hard, why? Because you turn on the TV, what will you have? Again, features on lawyers, on, you know, we're always glorifying. I mean, we need a little bit of lawyers, but not too many. <laughs> okay. I, I said, whatever I say sometimes, I may be off. <laughs> so, that's not necessarily the same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, bottom line, what do I, what do we really think as government so in harnessing innovation? We'd like to borrow this analogy uh, from a report in the world, the world Bank on innovation that you know governments need. Our government, particularly, needs to be a good gardener, preparing the ground, fertilizing the soil, watering the plant, and removing rest, uh, weeds and pests. In the Philippines, we introduced uh, the K to 12 program you know, as a as a mechanism to make changes in basic education and. Higher education is waiting more or less for what's happening in basic education because you know, you know they will just get whatever outputs students they get from basic ed. But the question I, I also wonder is are the changes enough to prepare a future workforce for the road jobs of the future? Uh, you know, and as I was pointing out earlier, I was hoping we would have had um, a bigger, uh, no, even one person from Chet in the ed from upper higher management direct from level or above. No? I look at the participants. It's, I think I have one, we have one or two. No? But it's, so what do we need to do? We need skills. Uh, skills. We just already mentioned. Key skill would be you know learning how to learn, unlearn, relearn, and unlearn. <laughs> Sorry, learn, unlearn, and relearn. No? Lifelong learning, especially teachers because they are the our models. No? But I wonder. <laughs> okay. So, I did not say more than that. But the World Economic uh, Forum, again, describes what are the future skills, grouping them into foundational literacies, competencies, and character qualities. And uh, as suggested by various innovation statistics, we were really underspending in R&D, less than a fifth of 1% of GDP, where, where, as UNESCO says, preferably spend 1%. Uh, then compare with how we spend in you know relative to our neighbors, I will not say more. <laughs> but we look at number of stuff of number of persons. Uh, it's, it's sad. But on the other hand, uh, what's what's positive is that we seem to be getting better support now for an innovation ecosystem. You know, we have DTI, DOST, and Ched now working together with this industrial roadmap for this IQS, no? innovation-led industrial. Uh, sorry, inclusive innovation-led industrial strategy and government is, you know, have, through the ICT is developing successor to digital strategy, implementing a national broadband uh, e-government master plan. The USD also has many things that Carol mentioned, science for change program, Balit Scientist 2.0 set up. Uh, so many things that are, that are being done, even the ICT again, there's Gov Cloud now, you know, Gov Cloud you allows us to to do fast, uh, easier exchange of resources and documents among government offices. It also have an online system. No? Uh, but even as all of these are happening, I I uh, uh, just uh, one or two slides more, very fast. Uh, was as we really have to ask how how do we maximize the impact of all of these initiatives? No? Uh, because unfortunately. Uh, it's not just about spending more. You know, there there should be absorbed capacity issues, complementary factors for innovation. Uh, so we can't think of quick fix quick fixing anything. You do need to remove wet, weeds and pests. Probably the most difficult uh, role that government has neglected. <laughs> uh, and you know, we, even the current procurement process is of doing business. So many 
think it's an indicator to do to make it regulation more adaptive. I think that's what the one of the things that we need to to to, to make sure of the in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and the UK. Many monetary authorities are using what are known as regulatory sandbox approaches, no? as, uh, particularly with fintech. Uh, Government, various government agencies are playing a role in creating an enabling environment uh, that fosters technological upgrading and innovations. But uh, I really wonder whether we're working in unison or are we duplicating efforts? And in a way, there we might be uh, we might be working at cross purposes. So we need a whole of government approach. Uh, this fire is unleashing a whole new level of uh, productivity and augmenting our lives in ways that can possibly dislocate people from jobs. Um, and the only issue is we need to address social protection for those people who cannot, who will have difficulty. There will be some people who cannot change readily. We need to revamp pension models with new realities of work and also consider uh, looking into social security benefits, uh, but beyond all of this, you know, uh, of course, even tax reform. Because, uh, the reality is, we need we need sources of revenue to do all of these things. This effort will really require all of us to work, all stakeholders to work together. Government is a key, it has a key role, but you know, everybody has a role to play, uh, especially media. If there's some people from the media, please you know, try to focus more on the things that matter. Uh, of course, here in the PIDS, we don't have a crystal ball that will tell us definitively how fast and, and to what extent robots or AI might even you know, replace humans, uh, if at all. But at least we have a guide of sorts and, uh, to, to, uh, to the likely consequences of the fire so that we can have a whole of nation understanding of what is to come and uh, improve our readiness for the future. So whatever great divides we have will not become wider. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mary Grace Santos. I'm with the Internet Society and the Better Broadband Alliance. First of all, I'd like to commend the speakers. This is such an exciting um, and very exhilarating talk. I've never seen such a, an excellent set of speakers, so uh, kudos to everyone. Um, my question is about uh, basically how do we make things more relevant and exciting for the common Filipino? Because one of the things, well, first of all, I'm a policy researcher, sir, so I can totally relate to what you were saying earlier, that the media doesn't find it sexy, I guess, to look at policy um, in terms of, um, uh, at least in terms of how we can better innovate um, as a nation and as a people. So how do we make all these new and emerging technologies more accessible, more relatable? Like the Manong Selling Taho, for example, how does, how does this all become um, relevant to his life? Uh, secondly, how can we make policy more accessible? Actually, I'd like to commend uh, some members of government. In Congress, for example, there are several bills that um, is uh, promoting innovation. Um, I am biased towards broadband connectivity because that's my advocacy. There's the open access in data transmission bill. Um, there's also uh, the amendment to 7925 or the Public Telecommunications Act. Basically, these are all efforts to make um, broadband technology more accessible to the public by bringing in competition, by liberalizing some of the uh, sectors and lower barriers to entry. So how do we make policy more engaging, more exciting, um, not only for broadband, but also for all of these other things that will affect not only us today, but the future of our children? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Grace. So uh, maybe we can ask all the speakers to... Um, Give the response. That is an excellent question. Um, you know, I, I have the opportunity of traveling quite a bit to uh, a number of countries, and one of my favorite things is to uh, get a copy of their local newspaper. One thing that I notice is, particularly in Southeast Asian countries, Singapore, 
um, and including uh, Thailand and even China and Japan, Korea. When I look at the front page of their newspaper, usually there's an economic story on the front page. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's the headline. And I would, you know, come here to the Philippines and look at the newspaper. There's hardly any economic story or business story on the front page. And there's just a business section, and it's, it's quite dynamic. So I'm kind of thinking, is, is this a cultural mindset? Um, but, but I think that science and technology, policy, business, they affect the quality of life. So it is exciting, it is important. Um, and, and so uh, for the journalists, maybe one of your responsibilities would be to make that link uh, clearer to, to Filipinos and to ordinary folks, to see that, yeah, this is relevant to them. Before the natural revolution is relevant to everyone. Science and technology is relevant to everyone. Policy is relevant to everyone because it directly affects their quality of life and their economic uh, progress. Uh, there was this question raised this morning about how come there's not a lot of kids who are going into science and technology. My simple take on that is that because there's a lot of graduates of science and technology who can't find jobs, and so they have to go somewhere else. Whereas if we take care of the science and technology innovation ecosystems in the country, and that will create jobs, and that will make science and technology more appealing, sexier to a lot of young people, especially if they're well paid. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Two things, just very quickly, because um, there's no one answer to this, yeah? Uh, but two things that, that we could do. Um, one comes back to what I talked about, and that's about university industry engagement, yeah? So if we got more of our undergraduates into industry, if industry saw the value of them, um, if we prepared them better to go into industry, it starts to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, industry employs more graduates, uh, the economy improves because there's smarter people in there. So that's one thing, that's one benefit. But the other thing is this, how to excite, and so that kind of gets word out there, you know, their families understand, it gets the word around about, about how good and what a good living in science and engineering is. But here's another one, and this is some dialogue that the, the, the STRIDE team, which I just left, have been having with DOST. Um, and this is exciting, because I think there's a kind of common interest here, yeah? Uh, DOST spends public money, spends your, your, your money, taxpayers' money, yes, yeah? It's not very exciting hearing that a researcher has, has made this many publications this and this many patents from your money, yeah? That's not very exciting, is it? What is exciting is hearing that your money is paid for research to provide clean water to communities elsewhere in the Philippines, to create jobs, to save jobs, to make new products, yeah? And so, if, and, and so this, this is a, like a PR thing, yeah? Because people do this in their research anyway, but if those people who fund research gave the public good stories rather than the academic scores, that starts to get people a bit more interested in what their money's being uh, used for, yeah? Yeah, let me re-echo what they have mentioned earlier, which is part of it is really, I mean, simple things like harnessing partnerships. Uh, we, we're, we coordinate, but amongst ourselves, we sure we talk. In fact, there's so many meetings sometimes. You get three, four meetings in a, in a day. You get so tired with meetings. But I, I wonder what exactly comes out of all of these meetings in government, you know? So I, 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 I tend to think that maybe we can do small things like, I was so amazed when I attended the Fisher conference where you, you, there was so much of the fire as actually already, technologies are already being applied, except that it's not being communicated well. I mean, unfortunately, not a lot of people know that, hey, this is something big, you know, and there are, there are opportunities out there for me to, to, to harness technology, to make things better, and to demand government to actually use technology much more to deliver services. I mean, right now, how much of us are, not, are partnering among different organizations, NGO groups, to be able to ask, like for instance, when, you know, just a specific example, case, case in point. Some people who create fake news, they, we just complain on Facebook and that's it. Right? 
but I noticed now that there was one case that the PWDs got affected really, and they're very, they're very have a strong advocacy. They know, and it's in the law. <laughs> so I think they're gonna file a case with, against two people. You, you probably know who I mean. Uh, <laughs> But that's not my point. I mean, if if you're if you're able, we, we already there are things are already there. You just need to learn from the experiences of these groups. But unfortunately, we are not very good at not just communicating, but even finding models. And and uh, you know, we we need to have poster boys and poster girls of scientists, uh, you know, of thinkers. The, the tendency is that, that the whole guy will probably not think of he, asking his child to become a scientist because he cannot even think of who's a scientist. I mean, I remember there was a time when before Punong Bayan, uh, uh, he was, uh, was so visible. And, but unfortunately, we lost him at a very young age. But that kind of person, and everybody knew, oh, it's Punong Bayan who says something, you know, immediately they listen. You know, and, those are the kinds of images people need to have in their mind. When, unfortunately, when they think of weather forecasting, they'll think, think of the regular, maybe Kim Atienza doing weather forecasting. You know, I mean, not, not, to, not to diminish Kim, but you know, you know what I mean. I mean, we need to identify also models. So people, that's part of a communication strategy. And unfortunately, I think the scientists are not very good at communication. <laughs> It's a different, so need, you need to make partnerships more with social scientists, put them all together. This kind of work that we did, I was very glad that you know we worked with the people at De La Salle, computer scientists. They had a different language altogether than we had, and they, they probably all felt the same way too. We had a different language, but I think we did well after two years of working together. And now you have this, you know, and I think it's a start, but it's not that we hope it's not going to end here. But it's all going to be up to all of us to start doing something. Yeah. Thank you. I have a couple of things to say about this question of how to make technology more exciting for common people. Because you mentioned that Tabo vendor, right? I imagine what would be more relevant to him is if somebody could tell him where he can go so that he can make more sales. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer. But I think what science and technology should be able to address is really this. To, to target especially ICTs is the concept of information poverty. Um, you know, we, we invest in science and technology so we can put actionable information into people's hands. And I think your advocacy on broadband is, you know, is the heart of that as well. Uh, we might be generating data somewhere, but if it doesn't get processed, it doesn't get into transformed into actionable information that people, ordinary people, can understand. It's where the communication issue also comes in. Uh, for the Tahoe vendor, it's where do I go in my route so that I can uh, sell more Tahoe? Probably, right? So can science and technology help me with that? Maybe somebody can figure that out. I mean, it's a routing algorithm for the Tahoe vendors. And maybe if they share information, that they can address, okay, nagpunta na ako dyan, magka na pumunta dyan, dito ka, etc. Uh, uh, you know, um, it's, it's communication. Right? Uh, that, that's one way. So it, it's an issue, a larger issue of information poverty, I think, in our country. We may not be able to immediately address economic poverty, but we can do something about the lack of intelligent information that gets to people that can, they can do something with it. So that, that, that's something we can target, and you know, we, 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 we hope that working together we do that. And another thing about um, perfectly, totally agree, outcomes, not outputs. Um, outcomes are important, and so when, when we talk about infrastructure and the investments we make in science and technology, we, I did not purposely mention any publications or any patents we have filed in my presentation, but I know this audience will not appreciate that. Um, and it's for different, entirely different audience altogether. But not to say that we also have to build up that portfolio, right? But uh, it's, we should not be fixated on that. I think we should be fixated on the longer, longer term. I think longer than our politicians can. Um, um, so in, in that sense, you know, we do a lot of things that are not really measured by these traditional metrics like patents and licenses and publications. We deploy technologies in community. There is no commercial licensing agreement when you deploy a weather station that you built yourself into a community. You don't ask them to pay royalties to you, but they, you conduct information education campaigns and you educate and you know, they, they, they learn about this technology and they use it, they learn to trust it. Right? So we are not measuring that. 
and but the world is a policy issue, I guess. Uh, the world is looking at our outputs as a country in terms of bean counting. Right? How many papers coming out of the Philippines vis-a-vis -vis Malaysia? How many patents, etc.? Sure, we need to do that, but um, we also need to have a metric for these technologies that get deployed in such a disaster-prone country like the Philippines, for example. Uh, what are we doing? Well, we are actually addressing that to some extent with technologies, but we are not really quantifying th th those things. So that, that direct engagement um, is something that needs to be captured. It's not covered by technology licensing. It's not covered by uh, those metrics, traditional metrics. Okay, and uh, also communication. Finally, you know, that's that we, we had a little shot at this when we were talking about space technology. I'm not a space scientist. I never dreamed I'd be building satellites, but I never looked at them as satellites. You know, one way of communicating them is th these are computers, aren't they? With cameras. And so with computers and cameras, we can take pictures, but they just happen to be in space at a very high vantage point where we can do these things at a very high spatial and temporal resolution. So uh, of course I, that needs to be explained in layman's terms. But, uh, but yeah, if, if you're way up there, 400 kilometers up, you can see almost everybody, right? And you can go back and take another picture as opposed to maybe taking several pictures on the ground, traveling to different places. Um, so yeah, that's why our attempt at that is to call these things, this is a very specific example, not really space, not satellites. Ordinary people may not appreciate that. Are we sending people to the moon, etc.? No, nothing like that. We're trying to address information poverty by putting instruments where we think they should be. Um, circling the earth, fostering international cooperation, cooperating with other countries to share their satellites with us so we can also, when our satellite is not around, we can use theirs, etc. So I'll, I'll stop there. I hope that addresses the question. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm interested in what Dr. Albert mentioned earlier, the whole location paradigm. Because I, I remember uh, in the 1990s, the common complaint in the Philippines was the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. <laughs> so um, one of the proposals that we did then was to get the executive and the executive and the, the um, legislature in one platform, you know, and that's, that's the LEDAC, so you have a common legislative agenda. Now, um, on the fire, the fourth industrial revolution, I was just thinking that our approach is really fragmented. Uh, so we have, for example, you mentioned the CHED and um, was it DTI and the OST getting together and working on you know, innovation and industry strategy. But can we have a platform that looks at the forest? Because even with us in Congress, that's a big problem. For example, Boyet here is the concept of ICT, so his uh, referral of bills would be broadband and things like that. But sometimes you have legislations that's referred in another committee that actually negates the effort that's being done in his committee. And in Congress, we have like what? Over 70 study committees. You may have an innovation bill in the Small and Business Committee. But there's another committee that handles a particular bill that sort of impacts and negates the effort made in another. So, <laughs> so can I go back to the whole of nation paradigm? And would the medium term development plan be? <coughs> A platform because you actually have a an accompanying legislative agenda, which which sort of um, works everything together like you know you seamless walang contradiction so all of us get we we are behind something so we move in one direction. Just me. Okay. Well, you know I've been working for government since uh, what was it 1999 and. Uh, Sometimes it's, you know, I, I, I sympathize with many government, with the people in the bureaucracy where, where we're doing our little, little things and in the, in the lab, you know, when you start asking, so what exactly have we done, you know? Uh, it's, it's tough, you know, so what exactly can we do? I mean, so oh, the, the little, I mean, the, 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 sorry, I'm saying that there have been models, Australia, Particularly, I'm, I'm glad that there are a lot of uh, number of Australians who are around. Uh, they they seem to be at the forefront, talking about this platform of having a whole of 
government first and a whole of nation approach. Because indeed, we tend to have fragmented approaches that in the end, there's no way of, you know, you just hear a cacophony of voices <laughs> and uh, there's no symphony around, there's no conductor. So it's leadership that we, that matters. But unfortunately, so I, I should not say anything more. Uh, I might get into trouble. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, whatever leadership problems that we may have, that we sh that they should be at the forefront. Like, I look back that there were some aspects of whole of government already there with, during the time of President Ramos. He said it when we were all being told to have, uh, you know, very, um, uh, you know, very structured way of doing things. But now it just disappeared. I mean, maybe the, the, the difficulty with us in government, with the government bureaucracy, is we don't realize that our politicians are on a on a different um, calendar, you know, a moving calendar of sorts, and then so we don't know how to to also communicate with them. So I think we need to 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 discuss among ourselves, and that's why I hope those of you who are in government, we are sort of thinking of having a a next round of talks amongst ourselves to sort of ask. So what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we really need to, to to put this agenda forward, and and the whole of nation, I think, would be our, our way to do it. And it's not, you know, and because it's whole of nation, there must be somebody who's sort of uh, giving us the an overall uh, vision. That vision is somewhere there. There's a little bit, but unfortunately, sometimes we're, we're, we push push and pull in various directions, and then we send the wrong signals to the international community. I just want to add a little bit. Um, to be able to implement the fourth industrial revolution and also to implement the building of science and technology innovation ecosystems, that requires a corresponding optimized uh, government bureaucracy. I'm referring to not, not specific people. I'm not talking about even leadership of individuals. I'm talking about government structure. And, um, you know, um, appropriately, a lot of our uh, government officials in the Department of Science and Technology, DTI, CHED, they, they would go visit places around the world, just like what uh, uh, David mentioned. They went to uh, North Carolina State University, the, the Triangle Park, to kind of look at these structures of, of, you know, how universities and uh, uh, industry uh, interact. I think the same thing should be done in terms of examining the government bureaucracy or government structures of, of successful countries uh, to be able to spawn this kind of uh, successful innovation ecosystems as well as you know implementing the fourth industrial revolution. I think it's fine to kind of acknowledge that perhaps uh, the Philippine um, bureaucracy is not the optimized uh, arrangement, government arrangement, to be able to implement this. And, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, it's, it's good to always improve, and there's always room for improvement. Um, so, um, for, for instance, one last point. When I was in Israel, they have, of course, these different uh, ministries, but uh, there is a, uh, an overarching uh, government uh, entity, which is called the Israel uh, Innovation of 40, which kind of uh, serves as the, uh, the synchronizer and the overseer of all of these government agencies so that they could be properly coordinated to come up with a seamless bureaucracy for implementation. So I think something like that might be applicable for the Philippine uh, Senate. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything about this, uh, but, but, but a couple of things. Um, so, so Malaysia as well, they have cross-government organizations, AIM, um, uh, which is a Malaysian term meaning Malaysian uh, Innovation Agency, yeah? um, and it's supposed to coordinate innovation across all of the governments, but in order for that to happen, someone's got to make it happen, yeah? and it's not going to happen from somebody in one of the very well-meaning departments. yeah. Um, and so we've, we've worked really closely with DOST and DTI, we've run events, we've invited people from other government departments, and I'm not going to tell you which ones, but they haven't come yet. Yeah? Um, and so it needs somebody from above to say, you must do this, or we'll set up this agency. Yeah? So that's the first observation. And these are observations as an outsider. When I was talking there, I kind of felt like I was one of you, because I've lived through this for five years. But this is as an outsider. 
Uh, and it's a, an observation of the cycle of government in the Philippines. And maybe you already know this, so I apologize if, if you do, yeah? Um, many countries have a much stronger party political system. And so they have policies which run from year to year to year through administrations, yeah? I, I don't see that here. I also see a cycle of government which is relatively short and fixed, yeah? Um, and so I've lived in two, two administrations here, and I, it, it's not my position to say good or bad things about any of them. It's just that they are different. And it seems to me that when one administration takes from over from another one, there's not a huge amount of continuity. It makes long-term planning really, really difficult. I have no idea how you change it, and maybe you don't, just that people like us have to try and work within it to achieve the kind of things we've been talking about. I hope that I've not said anything out of order there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're out of time, but uh, I promised uh, the gentleman here. I'll call on him. Good afternoon. I am Emmanuel Pacheco Lianyu from Central Mindanao University. This has something to do with university industry engagement, in which uh, part of the program of the USD is that JLSS, in which uh, the entering uh, third year uh, college students have the chance to, to have that. Uh, uh, OJT in, in any industry that they would wish to. Luckily this year we have sent about four students who are with uh, uh, PTRI and simply imagine they come all the way from Mindanao coming to Luzon just simply to have this industry uh, uh, experience and we are very thankful to Mom Carol for having this very good program. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, we, we, we're out of time, so maybe, maybe uh, after the session, those of you who would have questions may approach our speakers or, or give your questions to the IDS. Uh, so uh, maybe give our speakers a round of applause.